How do you keep good people? Oh, that's easy. You pay them well, you give them challenging work, you give them career progression, and the combination of all of this I found for me worked really well. And I learned that in London. When I started with Accenture, which is a global management consultancy, my salary was 40% above the market rate. It was £28,500 starting salary with a £10,000 golden handshake straight out of uni way back then. My law graduate friends were earning 14000 and you know what that extra money did? I would sit at my desk and I would focus on the work. I would put 100% and I knew I wasn't going to get that money anywhere else out there in the market. Had they paid me £14,000, I would be there working and looking around for, the, uh, for other jobs that paid better. Mm. If you pay so much more, it helps your team just maintain that focus because they just know, you know they're not going to get the same salary anywhere else. I'll tell you something, right? Paying your employees more is actually better for your business. The attrition rate is lower, the retention rate is higher, and therefore your training cost is lower. And the benefit of that is the consumer offering remains consistent. Imagine going into a business and you get served by someone who's really great. They leave and then the next minute it's someone else and the service is shoddy or it's rubbish. That's going to affect your brand in the, in the mind of the consumer. makes such a big difference. Yeah. In three years, I've managed to open up four shops. And you might think that's poor. That is actually excellent, and I'll tell you why. Because see, if you were to come to my office, if you were to open up the hatch and look at the foundation, that foundation that I've spent the last three years building can support a 300-storey skyscraper. I'm in no rush to build a big business. I'm doing it right, so I'm focusing on the foundation, and I've just been busy building the foundation for the past three years. You're not going to hear a boss pizza, and then bang, we're everywhere. So that, 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 that's the way that we're going to, we're going to expand this business. My property portfolio is mixed, it's both commercial and residential. I fell into it by accident when I was age 20. I was living with my parents at that point. I'd left school, I'd worked full time for four years, managed to save up £5,000. It was enough to put a deposit down on a house. Got the house and moved into it and decided I don't like it. Moved back in with my parents and I rented out the house and I thought, that's when the penny dropped. I thought, wait a minute, someone else is just going to pay the mortgage and I'm going to get a house out of this. So that's that's where it started from there. Just every couple of years, again, don't be in a rush. Every couple of years, saved up enough money to buy a, a flat and then saved up some more money to buy a flat. And in those days, a flat would be about 50, 60,000. You would need five, 10% deposit. So what you, year would that have been roughly? Late 90s, that yeah. Is. This is where a lot of people get it wrong. They think they're, they're buying an expensive flat. No, all you have to worry about is just can you save up enough money to afford the deposit? That's it, the 5%. So if a flat 60,000, all you need is 3,000 pounds. And you ask any young working person, can you save up 1,000 pounds at a push? And they'll probably say, you know what? If we really tried, we probably could, right? Keep going, yeah. Do that three times, and then you've got enough to buy a flat. It wasn't my intention to get back into property, but the next door property came up for sale and thought, you know what, that's quite handy, I'll buy that. Residential or commercial? Commercial. commercial. And then the next door property came up, oh, that's quite handy, I'll buy that. And then the next door one came up and that's got like 40 car parking spaces, you know what, that, that, that'll come in handy, I'll buy that. Just by me being there on Almada Street, I ended up buying like 10 properties within a one acre site all joined together and the land and marriage value of that is insane. It's like worth, worth so much money. Whereas the individual properties are maybe worth like 400,000, 200,000, yeah. But the land and marriage value of having all of that in Almada Street is just phenomenal. And someone wanted to buy a small stake in Boss Pizza. I sold it for £100,000 for 5% and that valued Boss Pizza at £2 million. This is when it was still in the runway. It hadn't even taken off yet. So we're still on the runway and we're just about, the plane's just about to lift off now. So the valuation is just going to increase more and more over, over, over the time. Where you win in property is if you play the long game. If you play the short game, there is a higher risk that you end up with not very much because you know, by the time you pay your legal fees, your stamp duties, you know, all of, the, all of the, the hundreds of overheads, it's not that lucrative at all. So where you win in property is if you play the long game. In my early 20s, I saw my dad and my uncle have a discussion. They bought a cottage for £53,000, right? It's 53,000, but they paid 56,000 because they really wanted it, and the lady was quite determined that she wanted more, so they paid 56,000 pounds for it, 3,000 pounds over. And I remember my dad and my uncle thinking, Gosh, we've paid too much for that, we've paid 3,000 pounds over, right? Fast forward 20 years, that, that 3,000 pounds is insignificant. Mm -hmm. So, what I've learned from that is if I really want a property, I don't mind paying an extra 5, 10, 20, 30,000 pounds for it, even 100,000 pounds for it. I don't mind because if you take the long term view, that £100,000 or £50,000 is insignificant. 
And would you go residential or commercial if you were starting from scratch with nothing? Commercial all day long. Commercial right. property is so easy and there is so little regulation. So for Residential, you've got pat testing, the gas safety certificates, you've got the uh, tests, le le Legionella yeah. tests, and then and then once the tenants are in, there's so much regulation that protects the tenants, which is good as well. But there's so many rent deposit scheme, there's so many rules and regulations, and that's why all of my residential properties are let out through agents because I just don't have the time to deal with all that nonsense. Commercial is really easy. I've had properties where the date of entry comes, I get the key. I hand it to the agent, he advertises it, and I don't have to spend a penny. I don't have to spend a minute's worth of effort improving the place or getting it done up. You know, I have to spend no time, no effort on that. Get an FRI lease on it. And yeah, it's full repairing, insuring lease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that basically what that means is, for the viewers who don't know, the tenant is responsible for everything. If there's a leaky roof, the commercial tenant is responsible. The lights go out, it's the, it's the tenant's responsibility, whereas it's totally the opposite mm -hmm. in residential. So I love commercial because it's so easy. No one is mentioning this. You must have money in the bank because even having money in the bank gives you options. If it just sits there and sits there. I've had money sitting in the bank sometimes for years and you hear all of these gurus saying oh, it's losing its value. It should be invested in something else. My opinion, it should sit in the bank. I'm all right then, I'm all good. <laughs> yeah. I get absolutely <laughs> slated. Yeah. The same time that I bought one property, he's bought about hundreds, do you right. know what I mean? So I owned 10 properties in one block in Hamilton, right? There was one property I didn't own and if someone else bought that, that would have been a thorn in my side forever, right? And I just said to the guy, that this was many years ago, 15 years ago or something, shop was worth about 40, 50,000 pounds. I said to the guy, I'll pay 80,000 pounds. I want the date of entry to, to be tomorrow. And he agreed and I got the keys the very, the very next day. I was thinking, had I not had the money sitting, there, sitting in the bank, someone else might have bid 60,000, you know, outbid me and got the shop and then that would have been not been great for me. Yeah, that's why I think it's always good having money in the bank. I said to the guy, I want the date of entry to be tomorrow. And he said, okay. So I phoned my solicitor up, Carties of Hamilton, Jim Toner. He'll verify this. I said, Jim, the date of entry is tomorrow. He goes, it can't be done. I said, Jim, it's a bit of paperwork. Just fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. and he goes, I think, uh, I think we've all had that conversation yeah. with oh, the solicitors. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> he goes, okay, let me see what I can do. Uh, it was a cash purchase, no call report, no nothing. So they, they managed to do it. And he did it. Of course, they just try and drag it out for seven or eight weeks to justify their fee, don't they? Always I know, I th think about it. And I'm, I'm in London. I, I'd been working in London where you're doing like 30 page proposals back and forth on a daily basis. What a solicitor does, right? I'm not bad mouthing solicitors, right? It's, it's like, oh, here's a here's a property. Yeah, the, the, it's got a roof and some walls and here's the deeds for it. I, I'm selling it to you here. Can you check that? Is it okay? And you say, yeah, it's okay. Right, we're happy to exchange. That's roughly what lawyers do, right? And why does it need to take eight, nine weeks, six, seven weeks? So I said to Jim, just do it. And he did it. If somebody came to you just now and wanted to buy Boss Pizza, yep. what would you, what'd you value it at? And is it for sale? Uh, Boss Pizza is not for sale. Boss Pizza is my project for the next 10 years. Um, well, at least seven to 10 years. I'm going to retire um, when I sell Boss Pizza 10 years. I'm going to be 60 at that point. Um, I'm not in Boss Pizza to make money. I'm in Boss Pizza to just see how far we can take this little business and to grow it. That's the business challenge for me. And I want the people that come on this journey with me to enjoy the fruits of that, of, of that journey. And is that the reason behind the, see the social media stuff and the TikTok stuff? Yeah. Is that kind of the reason that, like it's quite good just following your journey as well. Is yeah. that why you're doing that as a kind of, the, to show the progress. The, the TikTok I'm doing because I love talking about business. And I think the reason I'm doing TikTok is there are too many gurus out there giving rubbish advice and charging a lot of money. And if I can move into that space and give experiences from my own business journey free of charge, someone might say, you know what? Yeah, that's a good point. That's just saved me two thousand pounds in this bullshit and course. Do you get messages from people and all, all that? All the time. What, what's if you had any good TikTok hate? Because there's some hate out there as well. There's some real kind of nut jobs out. There. Destination rather than the journey, yeah. enjoying the journey and enjoying the growth. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying the journey. We're bringing on some amazing franchisees, and we're all excited about building a really fantastic business. And that is my mission to build a fantastic business and I can look back and say, you know what, yeah, I started that and yeah, I grew it to being a massive operation across all over the UK.
Maybe they should have a niche instead of the business in Guru. You can be like, maybe I have to, because the thing I'm thinking of in my conversation right now is, I want to be a franchisee. Because if I work with someone like you that's got all the experience in business, think about the lessons that I would learn from other businesses going forward as well. So yeah. maybe that's your, your niche. I'm not going to sell the business advice. You can be a franchisee with it and you can be part of the, the growth. I think that, that goes hand in hand. If anyone is a franchise partner with me, they become my partner and we're on this journey together. And the only way Boss Pizza is going to succeed is if those franchisees are succeeding. Yeah. And my mission is to make them as successful as possible. And if I do that, I tell you what, they're going to grow the business for me. Yeah. They're going to come back to me and say, Ajmal, my brother wants a franchise. My friend wants a franchise. So I'm going to use the franchise network to grow the business to being like a multi-hundred unit operation. And Domino's can be in the dust. Well, let's see. Ajmal, brilliant to have you on. Yeah. Thanks for taking